Hey folks, in this video we're talking about four things you can steal from Molly Tuttle's White Freight Liner Blues. And as I said in my Q&A video, I'm working off this performance. If you'd like the full tab of her arrangement, you can find it on my website, LessonsWithMarcel.com. Let's get into it. Molly Tuttle is obviously a beast at cross picking. She does it throughout this entire arrangement at breakneck speed and while singing. But there is one chord that she cross picks over more than any other chord, and that's the F chord. Now we're capoed at the fourth fret, so we're playing out of the C shape, and that would make our F chord the four chord. The pattern she's using is a pretty standard cross picking pattern, and it appears in tunes like Beaumont Rag. It goes between implying a major chord and a major six chord, and it sounds something like this. The real question though is, how can you cross so many strings while picking and play it anywhere near that fast? There's two big schools of thought. And the first one is alternate every pick stroke. And this seems to be what all the hot shots of flat picking are doing these days. So people like Chris Thilly, Brian Sutton, and it's kind of hard to see, but in the video I think Molly Tuttle is doing this as well. The other approach is to conserve some motion by repeating a pick stroke. This is normally accomplished by going down, down, up. This is favored by the Stanley Brothers, their guitar player was George Scheffler, he did this a lot, or uh, Doc Watson, Tony Rice, I think both those players do a down, down, up motion. There are some other strange patterns as well, for instance, uh, Jesse McReynolds of Jim and Jesse, he was a mandolin player and he favored down, up, up, which is immediately recognizable, though very strange, I can't get a hang of it. From a practical standpoint, you should probably be able to do both and then make your decisions from there. They do sound different and they serve different purposes. For me, if a cross picking pattern is ascending, like this one in White Freight Liner, I like to use down, down, up. If a pattern is descending the strings, I like to alternate. Now to practice this, you should probably get on your phone or your computer, wherever, and find a metronome with a progressive feature. And what that means is that you can set in a starting tempo and a goal tempo, and over the course of several minutes, it will speed you up to that tempo. Um, I, I would set that starting tempo maybe around 60 BPMs and the goal around 120. And then as you get better, you get more comfortable, you can raise those starting and goal tempos. All of the guitar fills in an arrangement don't have to be blazing fast. They don't have to be constant subdivisions. In fact, I think it's more challenging for the player and probably the ear as well to have syncopations throughout, right? Intentionally putting in rests and throwing notes off the beat. Tony Rice is an example of a player that did that all the time. Molly Tuttle keeps using a couple measures as a motif here. And every time they come out a little bit different, but they always serve the same purpose as breaking up the monotony of that constant subdivision. And, and really, it gives us context for when she's really cooking, right? Because when she's going fast, we can compare it in our brains to that earlier motif we heard that was all syncopated, and we know that she's really going now. Sometimes when you have songs that are all that constant subdivision, that break is just this constant stream of 8th notes or 16th notes, you don't get that same context. Anyway, here's the measures in question. Bluegrass is known for having a small palette of chord choices. Most songs fall into the category of only having one, four, and five in their chords. And really the only accepted embellishment is to turn that five chord into a dominant seven chord. Now, White Freight Liner Blues does only have three chords, but Molly Tuttle is really not afraid of exploring the possible extensions of these chords. In the second line of the song, she's already giving us two measures of a C add 9 chord. This is in the kickoff before the song even starts. Then most times the F chord comes up, she's cross picking it, right? Implying the major chord and then the major 6 chord back and forth. In her first break, she alternates between including the major 7 and the ninth of the F chord. <laughs> and 
In her second break, she wholeheartedly commits to this F add 9 chord before cross-picking some of the chord's upper extensions, right, 11, 6, and the 3rd. I don't know about you, but I don't remember F6-9 at 11 being a bluegrass chord, but Molly Tuttle's convinced me through her arrangement. If all these numbers sound scary to you, don't worry about that. There's an easier way to think about it. Basically what we're doing is we're taking the chords we know from the key of C, C, F, and G, and we're adding other notes from the C major or pentatonic scale to those chords. Here's an example. So here I have just a normal C chord. I also happen to know a little piece of the C major scale. So I'm just going to use those six notes. They're 3rd fret, 1st fret, and open on your highest two strings there. I'm going to add those notes to our C chord. So the first one I have available is that, then I have this, and this. That's a lot of new chords. And they all have names, right? This is C major 7, this is a normal C chord, this is C at 9, this is a normal C chord again, this is a C with the 11th, and this is C with the 5th on top. I actually really like this one. But the names aren't the point, really. What's important to us is the colors. Now, you can mix those chords into a song without knowing the names of them. There's no problem with that. This is an obvious one. You hear it a lot from the bluegrass elite, but it seems to be forgotten by a lot of the local acts. It's something a guitar player can do to reset the rhythm. Normally a guitar player is playing boom chuck, which means lighter strums on beats one and three and heavier strums on beats two and four, right? Boom, chuck, boom, chuck, or one, two, three, four. Now, if you put a heavy strum on beat one instead, it resets the rhythm, resets the rhythm. And what that does is not only does it make everyone listen, but it lets everyone know that something happened. And you can use it to clue in either just a chord changing or the start of a new section. It's very effective. I want to give you an idea of how it sounds, and I'm just going to use this one chord, just the C chord. I would never use it like that because I'm not really signaling anything. Now if we think about this song, what if I did that heavy strum at the beginning of every chord change? So here's the top, it starts on an F chord. If you don't believe me that it's useful, here's a clip of Molly doing it at the end of a verse. Alright, cool. If you like that video, please comment, please subscribe, please check out my website, LessonsWithMarcel.com, a bunch of free stuff. I have some tasks for sale. You can also find me on Facebook, you can find me on Instagram, you can also join my mailing list if you'd like. But, until next time.